Over the last seven years, we've been battling to say to people, it's not just what food you consume or what the quantity of food you consume, it's what's the quality of the food that people are consuming. Now, that's now accepted science. It wasn't just a few years ago. And there's a clear intersect between nutrition security, food security, and public health. We know if we don't address it, the consequences of public health are dramatic. One in three children in our country is malnourished. And then we complain about maths results or science results when we've almost tied the hands behind the backs of one in three children in this country. We have handicapped them, and we know we're handicapping them, and we don't have the political will to do it, even though there are solutions that are cost effective. Obesity. It's interesting because I've made this mistake myself in terms of talking about um, the, the face of, of famine in mm. Somalia and obesity as being kind of a reflection of the massive divide between rich and poor. Um, you're either um, starving and emaciated or else you are obese. And actually that isn't the case because in many respects it's the poor malnourished communities that are also struggling with obesity. But for people who are this poor, firstly, your main concern is filling the hole in your belly the quickest way and the cheapest way possible. There's plenty of evidence to show that if a baby is born underweight, when they're exposed to calories later in life, instead of putting on muscle bulk, they actually put on fat. So by the time an undernourished, uh, underweight child, baby, reaches adolescence and adulthood, when they're getting more and more calories, maybe empty calories, but they're getting those calories, they're getting, they're getting heavy. So we need to start looking at the obesity issue as part of the malnourishment issue. They, the two are inseparable. What we are incubating here is, is a very dangerous mix. And I keep talking about this. We are creating the new apartheid in the world between those people that have and those people that have nothing. And it's a division that is so deep-rooted that unless we begin to deal with it, we can't talk about the stability of our world. And we can't talk about a planet that is sustainable and a recognition that we have only one planet. There's no planet B here. Oh, a very food insecure family is one where they're cutting out the calories as well as the diversity. But for me, it's that low food, in, food um, uh, secure family that is interesting because they look like they're food secure. They look well nourished. They may be plump. They may you know, be walking down the road in nice clothing, but actually they're malnourished because they're getting all the carbs they need to satisfy the need for food right now, but the, it's, it's the, the malnourishment that is so invisible. Um, and I think that's what we really, mm. we really need to think about. And so this is the crisis that we face, that there's this broken system of food in the world. And so that you end up with a billion people who are chronically malnourished. That means they don't have enough food to eat, both at the macro level and the micro level. There's a billion that are just micronutrient deficient, and there's a billion that are obese. That's almost one in two people are affected. Their health and their productivity, their human productivity, is affected by the food they eat. And so it's a crisis, it's a catastrophe. Time and time again, when this conversation comes up, it invariably goes to, well, let's just start food gardens everywhere. That's the solution. It is definitely part of the solution. I wouldn't knock it for a second, but it's not the only part of the solution. You know, you can ask a poor person to start their own food garden, but if someone is this hungry and this marginal, if they are going to invest three hours of their labor today, they need to be able to feed their family on that labor today, which means they need to leave the, leave the day with money in their pockets. They can't afford to invest three hours of labor now in the hope that they'll get spinach leaves in two, three months' time. So that's already um, a, a major hurdle. Um, when, when communities are that resource scarce, it's um, a, a few hours a day investing in a food garden is a huge investment, and it's also quite a risky one. There are solutions. And you know, part of the work that we've done here in this country was uh, looking at staple food. So what do people in this country eat, mainly? The poor people. It's maize meal. Again, they buy it one cup at a time. So how do we take the staple food of people and enrich it with vitamins and minerals? And again, we worked with the government to create the appropriate regulations 
so that it's compulsory for a, all companies to fortify the, the maize meal with folic acid, with vitamin A, with iron. And already in our measurement of uh, the impact of this in the sentinel sites that we have, we've seen a 30 to 40 percent drop in neural birth defects because of folic acid. And that's what we're saying is that there's such practical solutions. If we had any political sense, we will implement immediately. Because the science is there, the money is there, the political will isn't there. Unless we begin to deal with this, we are going to be challenging the future of our children. And the reason why I'm so strong on this issue is that there's no other planet. And what we, at the moment, are going to hand over to our children is a disaster. It's an ecological disaster. It's a human catastrophe. And it's just a few decades away.